the apostles. And if you turn in your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter, let's have a little prayer.
this is about the midnight cry. It says, as to the character of the word, the name of the chapter is the tenth day of the Jewish seventh month. As to the character of the word which resulted from giving what was called the midnight cry, it evidently was a special work of God. It was not, as many suppose, the result of fanaticism. After the disappointment in October 22, 1844, there were those who claimed that uh, what the experience they'd been through was uh, fanaticism. So James White is making a comment uh, to that history about, they would call it fanaticism of the devil, uh, that it was, uh, Hines was reported to have said that it was mesmerism seven feet deep. And uh, so they had, for the majority of them, they would deny the midnight cry. The midnight cry is uh, the end of the time period that is recorded in uh, Daniel both 8 and 9. James White says, because it bore the marks of the special providence of God, it was not characterized by those extremes ever manifested where human excitement and not the word and spirit of God as the controlling influence. It was in harmony with those seasons of humiliation, rending of heart, confession and complete consecration of all, which are matters of history in the Old Testament and are matters of duty in the New. Because it was subversive of all those forms of fanaticism which made their appearance somewhat in connection with the Second Advent cause, and it is a fact that Satan had crowded upon some and who bore the Advent name almost every stripe of fanaticism he could ever invent, but these were at once swallowed up by the solemn power of the midnight cry as the rods of the, of the magicians were swallowed by Aaron's rod. Uh, one of the problems that we have in Adventism today is that we have no longer a knowledge of uh, an adequate knowledge, however, I should say we, have, we should probably have no knowledge, but we, we don't have an adequate knowledge of how it is that our past experience affects us as a people and its history. And uh, the man who wrote this book, his name is uh, Gerard P. Damsky. Damsky's book on the foundations of Seventh-day Adventist message and mission. Uh, he points out something in an uh, article I found by him. It's called The Seventh-day Adventist Doctrines and Progressive Revelation. In, in Advent history, The midnight cry was known several ways. It was known by the parable of Matthew 25, the ten virgins. It was known by, it was called, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. It was known by uh, the Seventh Month Movement. <clears throat> it was known by the Definite Time. <clears throat> and it was known by the Midnight Cry. And for the pioneers who went through the Parable of the Ten Virgins, which was known as the Midnight Cry. I mean, it was known by, Behold the Bridegroom Comes, Go Ye Out to Meet Him. The Seventh Month Movement, the Definite Time, or the Midnight Cry. It was for them an experience. Above all else, it wasn't just knowledge, it was an experience. And it was the experience that led them to understand later on the great truths that would later establish the sanctuary truth. Because the experience they were involved in, they knew they had been led by God. And Dan Steve points out in this article something about the experience relative to what we believe as Seventh-day Adventists. First of all, this is this I have to go over this because this is a little bit uh, takes a little time, but it'll help you to understand 
how the experience will affect us today, the relevancy of today, and how the same experience affected them when the Advent movement was taking place. Because if the Advent movement is going to be repeated to the very letter, the Advent team has some very good uh, insights as to what we can accomplish if we can understand the history of the Advent movement. He says, progressive revelation has played an important role in the development of Seventh-day Adventist, the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its theology. Sometimes in our groups of Seventh-day Adventists, we think everything we talk about is theology. The damn Steve here is not talking about theology. He's going to get to where he's going. But he's giving you some prerequisites so you can understand when he gets to the meat of this, what he's trying to tell you. He says, so... Progressive Revelation has played an important role in the development of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and its theology. By Progressive Revelation, I mean God's continuous unfolding of prior revealed truth. Without such Progressive Revelation, the unfolding of inspired truth, building on truth previously revealed and never denying it, the Seventh-day Adventist Church would not exist. Let me read that again. This Progressive Revelation Without such progressive revelation, the unfolding of inspired truth, building on truth previously revealed, and never denying it, the Seventh-day Adventist Church would not exist. It is based in the foundation of Adventist history. Had they not gone through that history, through God's leading hand in progressive revelation, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here, Jeff wouldn't be preaching this message, Jamal wouldn't be preaching this message, and we might be Baptists, or Lutherans, or Methodists, or Episcopalians, or you name it. But God has raised up a people called Seventh-day Adventists through progressive revelation. Now in the world today, there's a progressive revelation that is recorded in this book on page 30, and it's different than the progressive revelation that Dan Steve is referring to. And their progressive revelation works like this. The Bible no longer has unique authority for Western man. It's progressive in the wrong direction. It's negative, not positive. This is the influence that today we have in modern Adventist theology. They've adopted it. It's not based on the progressive revelation that we see recorded in Advent history, where God would lead the people step by step by his word. But we, in some respects, have adopted, not in some respects, in many respects, have adopted this uh, theory. And this is a quote from, uh, it's not an address, but it's a quote from a typical uh, Protestant thinker. He says, the Bible no longer has unique authority for Western man. It has become a great but archaic monument in our midst. It is a reminder of where we once were, but no longer are. And that should sound very familiar if you understand the controversy in Adventism. That's their same viewpoint. Where we once were, we no longer are. So they now see Adventism progressively, but in a very negative sense. It contains glorious literature, important historical documents, Exalted ethical teachings. I think Jeff mentioned that yesterday about moral teachings. But it's no longer the Word of God. So they see the Word of God as no longer being the Word of God. Today, Adventism sees Adventism as no longer being Adventism. It's the same paradigm. And we've adopted it. In our, in the understanding of our own history, we've adopted a progressive revelation that denies the very history in which we were found. When I was speaking to the court at the kitchen table this morning, I want to address the fact that these messages we hear this week are not about the people they're giving you. And it's not about the people who are not understanding correctly the foundation of Seventh-day Adventists. It's about the message. That's the truth. Because the message is the thing that will do its work from the heart. And then people will be able to understand where they're at. So when you hear some of us, it may seem like we're pointing the finger at people, but we're not. The message needs to be told in such a way that 
the truth stands out on its own in sheer light. And in so doing, uh, some people have to take the heat for the new life of mine. But the message is the important part. So Damski, uh, is speaking here about a progressive revelation. It gets back to the heart of Adventism, where God had led people. He says, throughout their history, Seventh-day Adventists have looked forward to discovering or receiving additional truth that would harmonize with prior truth. We've been looking forward to finding truth that would harmonize with prior truth. Now, he wrote this in 1991. I was a little more true then than it is today, but nevertheless, uh, Dan Steve here is holding the line on true progressive revelation. Ellen G. White, one of the principal founders of our church, kept this hope alive with such statements as this. This is from Councils of Writers and Editors, page 33. Truth is an advancing truth, and there are minds of truth yet to be discovered by earnest seekers. Uh, that was uh, Councils to Writers and Editors, page 33. In speaking of truth, she always meant truth as given by God in his divine word. He goes on to explain some other things about some of the fundamental beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. His article is being developed so that I have the 27 Fundamentals and Doctrines of Seventh-day Adventists. So, that's 28 now, 27. Well, the book, the book, 27. But now I guess they're looking at the 28. But they're only doctrines outside the history of Adventism. When they're isolated from that history, they were separated from the experience. And that's what's happened in Adventism. And Dan's truth to see comes to a point here in a minute, you'll see what he says. Doctrine, he says, clearly reflects harmony with religious experience of the pioneers. Doctrine clearly reflects harmony with the religious experience of the pioneers. In other words, doctrine didn't come along outside their experience. Doctrine was formulated by their experience. After the passing of the pioneers, the second, third, and fourth generation came onto the scene who living in a changing society with different challenges and having a different religious experience can still affirm the truth in one way or another, but feel it has lost its relevance. Now, he's making an observation. He's not making a uh, He's not making this a, a statement of what we should be doing. He's making an observation. He's not saying that we should see our past history in, in the form of what was relevant for us today. But he's saying that's how we've done it. It's the same as denying God's word as God's word, like the Protestants have done in progressive, their form of progressive revelation. He says they've done this so that they can see for themselves a present truth in current times and places. That's not present truth. The present truth is founded on the Word of God. And Ellen White, whenever, she, whenever you're reading the testimony, volume one, volume two, volume three, and even down into her dying day, when she used the word present truth, she meant the third angel's message. That's what she's referring to. The third angel's message is present truth. It began to be present truth on October 22nd, 1844. And it will be present truth up until probation closes in this world. So present truth cannot be maligned or set aside by relevancies of time or place. The view just presented gives the impression that doctrines are open-ended. That they are molded by the interaction of the community of believers in a socio-cultural setting with scriptural testimony as understood in those settings. When we do this, we take the Bible itself and we convert its teaching. When we take our own history and set it in our own contemporary setting and reinterpret it so that we get what we want out of it. By the way, this is the work of the enemy in the church. 
the called higher education today, but they've missed, they, they've missed the mark. But this view is not necessarily, Dan points out, the correct view. Then he goes on to say about our subject for this week, for these morning talks. When I read this, I was dumbfounded because of his observation. It's so relevant to where some of us are at to be studying prophecy. If you're a student of prophecy, you've been looking at the things the future for America has been, been presenting for a while, and you understand what Brother Damsey here has uh, observed, this is phenomenal. He says, anyone who wants to understand the soul and the genius of the Advent movement and wishes to perceive the full truth and continual relevance of its beliefs will never succeed as long as the current fundamental beliefs, 28, are studied in isolation from the action of God in the 1844 Advent experience. They will never be understood. The 1844 Advent experience, now this is Ellen White, he says, the 1844 Advent experience, now he's quoting Ellen White, open to view a complete system of truth, connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it brought to life the position and work of his people. As you become more familiar with these charts, this one, uh, we need to have them side by side. This is the 1850 chart, this is the 1843 chart. <coughs> Some of these terms that you will see, the parable of the ten virgins, uh, behold the bridegroom come going out to meet him, the seventh month movement, the definite time, the midnight cry, especially the experience that they had through this, the medium of uh, their testimony at, at, in the pioneer period, you will begin to understand what she means by connected and harmonious. Because God was leading his people step by step. And what we're going to cover this uh, briefly, we'll cover it briefly because we can only really touch the tip of the iceberg in four days. What Miller began to understand was first the 2520 in, in his uh, breaking of the, of, of the prophetic timeline. And then he began to understand the 2300 days. And from there, this was in 1819. And it took him from 1819 to 31 before he would ever present the message to the world. He, pre he presented his first message on August the 7th of 1831. But he had the light on the 2520 in 1819. So when she says that God's hand was in it, he was in it when Miller began to be converted. He was in it when Miller began to study the Bible with his concordance. He was in it when Brother Miller broke the seven times of Leviticus 26. And even Brother Miller didn't recognize this phenomenon. But Ellen White, from the train of inspiration, is telling us that God's hand was in it. It is connected and harmonious, showing that God's hand had directed the great Advent movement and revealing present duty as it has brought to life the position and work of God's people. Eventually, the position and work of God's people is revealed on the 1850 chart. So it's a long step-by-step -step, step progress, which is the a correct understanding of what was true progressive revelation. My point is not to understand progressive revelation. My point is that I like to see the importance of the correct look for yourselves into Advent history. You must take and dive in yourself. If you have to put your, before you can swim, you've got to get in the water. So you have to take, you have to take this uh, and look at it for yourself. Just said yesterday, what I say, what Jamal says, what he says, is not the authority. But you have to take it, see if what we're telling you, and match it to God's word, and match it to what you can get in the history books to see if what we're saying is right. And if you will, listen to what Dan Steve says. He says, it was a progressive revelation that illuminated the past present and future of God's loyal women people. Those terms, past, present, and future, Dancy is borrowing it from Millerite and Sabbatarian Advent terminology. 
James White uses those words. Ellen White uses those words. Past, present, and future. One of the things about the midnight cry, we all know basically what the midnight cry is about, right? It happened on October, well, it happened from August the 12th through October the 22nd, 1844. We know the basics. We know the basic history of it. But as students of Bible prophecy, if you've been following the future for America, has been putting out, you'll know that Jesus has a signature on in prophecy that is unique to himself. It was mentioned yesterday many times, and that is that he teaches the end from the beginning. He's the first and the last. Isaiah tells it, you can find it everywhere in the, in the Bible, that Jesus is the one who's able to tell the end from the beginning, the first and the last. And he brags about it in Isaiah. He says, do you have anybody else that can do this? No, only I. I am God. Only I can do this. And he can brag that he can do it. Well, the midnight cry, I'll, this is just, this morning I'm going to give you just a little glimpse of what the midnight cry, cry can teach us if we understand its history. This is Genesis 15, where the promise that he's going to put enmity between the woman and the seed of the serpent. Huh?
when we see Miller and we see James White and we see Hiram Edson and we see Josiah Litch and we see all the names of the pioneers, God is leading those people step by step. And it's because of the righteousness of Christ that's in the Word. So Dan Seed says, It was a progressive revelation that eliminated the past, the present, and the future of God's loyal remnant people. Many arguments used by those who seem to be dissatisfied, and listen, listen very carefully. Many arguments used by those who seem to be dissatisfied with the relevance of doctrinal, doctrinal formulation. Doctrinal formulation is buried in the history of the midnight cry and the experience of the Advent people after the midnight cry. But those who find no relevance in this, he says, have to do with the failure to see Adventist theology in the context of God's opening providence, providence at the time of the origin of the rise of the Advent movement. What that means is Seventh-day Adventists no longer see God's providence in the rise of the Advent movement. The need to participate mentally in the 1844 Advent experience is one of the most crucial challenges for every Seventh-day Adventist and those to understand, to those who are desiring to understand the movement. Emphasizing the crucial significance of understanding the past Advent experience, Ellen White has pinned. Now this is a statement that you've all heard in the past. When I read this, it's familiar to everyone. But here he's couched it in, a, in its correct application. I've heard it used by countless people, but here he's really brought it in, brought it home to where it really brings something for you that you can really sink your teeth into. We were told yesterday, yesterday we need to get off the breast, the milk of God's word. Well, Dan C. here places Ellen White's statement in a position where it's real food on your plate. It says this, as I see what the Lord has brought, I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. She considers it of sacred importance, sacred importance, for ministers and people to recapture God's providence in this original Advent experience. A revival of this experience is indispensable to the relevancy of the church's doctrines for believers and its proclamation to the world. If you want to give the third angel's message, you can't give it unless you understand the message through the history of Adventism. <clears throat> and she, he, he says she considered it a sacred importance. She challenged believers, now he's quoting from Ellen White, to revive and recount the truths that have come to seem of little value to those who do not know by personal experience of the power and brightness that accompanied them when they were first seen and understood in all their original freshness and power these truths are to be given to the world. That's a, that's a twin statement when she says in Great Controversy that this movement was a glorious manifestation of the power of God. These men and women, for them, it wasn't just words. They witnessed this glorious manifestation where hearts were melted and touched, where men and women repented of their sins. And it was, there was no excitement to it. It was a time in which men realized that they were going to meet their maker. They believed that Jesus was about to come. Today, some of the Adventists don't believe that. They do not believe it. And I'm speaking about myself. We're too busy doing many things. But we are not doing the business that he's called us to do. We don't find it. Well, we, we want something relevant. Does it fit in with my job? Does it fit in with my 
goal to get my degree. Does it fit in with my ideas of what I think higher education is? All those things make all said we see through a dark glass darkly, but friend, we've got our spray paint can and we paint it over the glass. So we can't see through it at all. It says here, yet as vital as this experience is, I don't like calling on believers to search for additional life. My friend has told me in many prophecy schools that if you want to be a student of Bible prophecy, that is our what we should be doing. Ellen White says that every SMD we should be a student of Bible prophecy. And if we are, there's new light. But the thing about new light, it always harmonizes with the previous light. It always comes in harmony. It never steps outside. So one of the things that understanding Advent history does, and understanding the history on these charts, it sets you on a very solid foundation. It's so solid. It's, I, I'm, this week I'll read you some testimonies. It's immovable. Immovable. Amen. And it places you on a height where you can see the past, the present, and into the future. Now, Ellen White had a vision in December of 1844. And it's the midnight cry vision. And in that vision, she was shown that the midnight cry was a great light. And it was set up behind the people of God. That's pointing to their history in the past. And it was a light for them in their present, where they were at presently. And she said it was a light that would lead them all the way along the pathway to the city of God if they keep their eyes fixed on who? On Jesus. So outside the relevancy of the midnight cry, there is no Seventh-day Adventist church. And when you, when you begin to teach outside the, its relevancy in history, you may call yourself a Seventh-day Adventist, but if so facto, you're not. You are not. She goes on to, he goes on to, there's things up here that... She's written that there was never a point which a period in which we will, there is no increased life for God's people. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation. But it's connected with the midnight cry. It's built on that foundation. It's not through relevancy. It's turned on its head and become something else. He says, it's true source. God is the source of advanced truth. God himself is the source of advanced truth. So when William Miller began in 1819 to advance truth, God was the source. Now the wife says that William Miller's mind was led by the angels of God. What we've become is, I'm speaking about myself. What we become is ironically what the Pharisees called Peter and James that day. Ignorant and unlearned men. But God by his grace can teach us advancing truth. And when he when he does, ignorant and unlearned men, what did they say about the apostles? That's the point. You know, I come to realize something one day after I got to go to Jeff a little bit. He's very crafty, this Mr. Man. He uh, was all his goal for us because God has led him to see something in Bible prophecy that the rest of us are yet quite able to see in his clarity. And Jeff will admit that he's too deep to have some, his own clarity. It needs to be improved. We all need it. But Jeff sees the importance of something in Daniel, chapter 11. 
is the uh, part of the way that God is going to revive us as people. And it begins with a proper understanding of what's on this chart. Everything points to Daniel 11, chapters, or chapter 11, verses 40 to 45. And that's where God wraps up this progressive revelation. That's where he brings it to its crescendo. And so Jeff has been led by the Lord in such a way so that we can uh, have a tool in our hands to see that if we will study these things for ourselves, the way God has led Jeff to do, and some of the rest of us in this room, we are going to see advancing truth in a new light in Daniel 11, like we need to see it, like we've never seen it before. It says here that uh, God is the source of advanced truth. If God has any new light to communicate, he will let his chosen and beloved understand it. This is from Ellen White. Without their going to have, without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness. That's from. Let me look at the footnote so you can get that response. That's from Brody Writings, page one twenty four. If God has any new light to communicate, he will let his chosen and beloved understand it without their going to have their minds enlightened by hearing those who are in darkness and in error. By the way, new light, he has a, you know, this is, this is in the uh, Journal of the Adventist Theological Society. They're very prolific in putting this out. I don't know if it's bi-monthly or but it's yearly. It's, you can still get subscribed to it. And uh, one of Jeff's friends is in here this, on this particular issue. William Shea has an article in here. There's a few other of Jeff's friends that are here. I have some at home. There's uh, Gerard Hassel is here. There's a few others. And, uh, but the damn seats are up here. There are good stuff, there's good things in here, but you know, you have to uh, take, a, take good with the bad. But, uh, the new light, regarding new light, there are some people in here who have articles that they think are, are new light. There are others that uh, out in our Adventist community that have their own opinion of what might constitute new light. Even in connection sometimes with old light. You know, they, they get in muddy water sometimes. And uh, I was telling the court this morning, our, our goal here is that we want them saved. We want, we want every seventh day Adventist in the kingdom. So it's not about us and them, but it's about <coughs> the, message, the message. There's conditions for those on the white points out who have advancing new life. There are conditions. Dan Steed has done a wonderful job. He's, he's, he's a great researcher. And he's listed, these are all Ellen White quotes. Uh, I'll, see me later. I'll, what I'll do tonight, I'll write down these quotes and I'll get them to you tomorrow in a list. I don't have time to do it this morning. I'll, I'll go to the footnotes and take each one and list it for you. I didn't have time to do it yet. But, but all these are Ellen White quotes. Conditions for reception of new life. The prerequisites for the bestowal of new life mentioned by Ellen White generally focuses on individual spirituality. They involve diligent and careful study of the Bible. That's number one. They involve diligent and careful study of the Bible. Number two, living a righteous life. Number three, growing in grace. Number four, having a vital connection with Christ. Number five, walking obediently in present life. Number six, having an attitude of humility. Seven, following the light of health reform. You can put these in your own order. You just have them in this order. Eight, accepting and applying the old truth. That's one that everybody don't like that bitter pill. They don't like that bitter pill. Well, here's another one. Goes down pretty hard for some. They don't like this medicine. You know, the cure is always painful. 
It says, accepting the spirit of prophecy. And then, being chosen and illuminated by the Holy Spirit. I didn't read it to you, but in this earlier part of the article, that particular part right there, he, he, he goes into that, but we won't go into that this morning. Being chosen and illuminated by the Holy Spirit. And the last, not the least, then, this one says, and advancing in proportion to life. That's what constitutes new life. So, uh, Brother Damstein has done us a, uh, God really, <coughs> Brother Damstein has left us. Two very good sources, this article and this book. Um, sometimes I get in trouble, but the importance of this particular book to those who are studying biblical and truth is beyond what I can actually to say to you. And I told the author of this book face to face that he doesn't understand himself what contribution this is <coughs> to the world. This book is a great con contribution. I got a little trouble for that. I think I heard his feeling. Uh, and then she says, well, you are, well, this is a quote from Ellen White. Nancy says this, in harmony with the foundations of Adventism. Now, if you notice, Jeff started out yesterday telling us about the foundations of Adventism. If you'll notice that Jamal and him both yesterday labored with us to understand in these timelines, in these uh, prophetic timelines, uh, four movements. not four movements, they're called uh, <coughs> not way marks, patterns, prophetic patterns. In these prophetic patterns, there was a period of darkness, Darkness, formation of the message, and there was a foundation laid. It's from here that we'll advance and we'll make headway. But if you remove that foundation, you're going to be lost. And if you understand the captivity of Judah, we may get to that this week. If you understand the captivity of Judah when she went into her 2520, she stepped off her foundation. And when she did, God had to punish her for 2,520 years. And we ain't got that much time at the end of the world. But the lawsuit that's recorded in Leviticus chapter 26, God has used as a means to chastise his people for millennia. It's gone on now until October 22nd, 1844, in the gathering. <clears throat> But at the end of the world, when those who are, were, will remain unfaithful to the uh, cause that God has raised up, and they will receive the mark of the beast, I mean Adventists will do so. And then when the message goes to the world and probation then closes to the world and they do so, God will once again have to carry out the loss of the world. And that's what the seven last plagues are all about. But from these plagues, there is no reprieve. There'll be no gathering. So what we're studying here is the most serious business we will ever deal with. It is serious. And it's because of these foundations. So he says, in harmony with the foundations of Adventism, <coughs> new truth always will be in harmony with previous truth and will never divert the attention from Christ or the special day Adventist mission. Now he says from Ellen White, let no progressive revelation understood in its proper sense, in its proper sense, in no way diminishes the relevancy of the truths upon which the Seventh-day Adventist Church was founded. Ellen G. White was cautioned, let not any man enter upon the world tearing down the foundation of truth that has made us what we are. Not one pillar of our faith is to be removed. Not one line of truth is to be replaced by new fanciful theories. Now, give so back on the day and several other things. <coughs> so what we have this morning, how, what, how am I doing on time? Anybody have an idea? I want to walk. Okay. Now, 
The truth for this time, God has given us the foundation of our, of our faith. He himself has taught us what is true. This is Ellen White. The truth for this time, God has given us a foundation for our faith. He himself has taught us what is true. One will rise and still another with new life, which contradicts the life that God has given under the demonstration of his Holy Spirit. The Advent movement was, here she calls it the demonstration of the Holy Spirit, great controversy, a glorious manifestation. When you look all these quotes up by Ellen White, she's connecting all these things with how God had his hand in the Advent movement. We are not to receive the words of those who come with a message that contradicts the special points of our faith. They gather together a mass of scripture and pile it as proof around their asserted theories. And while the scriptures are God's word and are to be respected, the application of them, if such application moves one pillar from the foundation that God sustained these 50 years, is a great mistake. Then, then Damski sums this up. He says, in harmony with the landmarks, Ellen G. White strongly defended the theological landmarks of Adventism that were discovered around the time of 1844. Those who seek to remove the old landmarks are not holding fast, she said. They are seeking to bring in uncertainties as to set the people of God adrift without an anchor. Now that was written in her day. The friends were living in our day. So if you want something relevant, you, you want an anchor. You don't want to be adrift without an anchor. That's, that's relevancy. In 1889, she defined the landmarks as follows. You might want to write these down. The passing of the time in 1844 was a period of great events. Opening to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary, transpiring in heaven, and having decided in relation to God's people upon the earth. Let me read that again. Opening to our astonished eyes, the cleansing of the sanctuary transpiring in heaven, and having decided in relation to God's people upon the earth, also the first and second angel's messages, and the third, this was just burden yesterday, unfurling the banner on which is inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. One of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God seen by his truth-loving people in heaven and the ark containing the law of God. The light of the Sabbath of the fourth commandment flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is an old landmark. Here she's taking you into Advent history. And here's why, one of the things you need to know, one of the prima facie reasons you need to know Advent history is because when you read Ellen White and you don't know that history, what she just said was past you. It goes right past you. Because when she says this is an old landmark about the immortality of the soul, who in this room can tell me when that came into Advent history? You can. You can. Who else can tell me when it came into Advent history? If you don't know, you don't know what she said. If you don't know, you don't know what the woman just told you. Would you like to know when it came in? Yes. All right. It came in in 1842 by George Strode. He wrote six articles on the immortality of the soul. And in those six articles, he proved, now this is, this is advancing life. In his day, this was new life. That was, they denied it. Miller himself would deny this life. Heim would deny the life. Lynch would deny the life. But eventually we understood it to be life. And he would tell us that there's only one who has immortality. And he gives it to his saints when he comes. The immortality of the soul supports the second advent doctrine. And it supports the first one. She called it an old landmark. That's the only one she calls an old landmark. You can look it up on your CD wrong. If you understand what she says in the great controversy about this landmark <coughs> and spiritualism in the world, when 
the papacy, the, new, the United States reaches across the Gulf and grasps hands of the papacy and spiritualism, the three unclean spirits that meet the, uh, that come upon the world uh, on the, in the book of Revelation, you'll understand the importance of this, this comment. She says, I can call to mind nothing more that can come under the head of the old landmarks. Then she, then she categorizes them all as the old landmarks. It says here that uh, Ellen White says, now you know, this article that Amstreet wrote was sent out by, to all the brothers who disagree with everything I just said. That's, it's, I rely on that. But the irony is that they disagree. You know, go figure. She says, our brethren should be willing to investigate in a candid way every point of conflict. That means that they should investigate this message candidly and openly and fairly. But the question is, will we? I mean, not just them, you and I. Okay. If a brother is teaching error, this is what Jeff's point was yesterday. Those who are in responsible positions ought to know it. And if he is teaching truth, they ought to take their stand at his side. We should all know what is being taught among us. For if it is truth, we need it. We are all under the obligation to God to know what he sent us. I'd like to know that from. Gospel Workers, page 301. This is a, now these are all quotes from Mama White when discussing new light. The way in which new light should be discussed is crucial. The Bible must be studied with fasting and earnest prayer before God. Fasting and prayer. The Bible is the norm of the evaluation of any new point. The Bible is the norm. This is Ellen White. It is the standard for every doctrine and practice. It is the word of the living God that is to decide all controversies. God's word is our foundation of all doctrine. Now there are some in our church that will teach you that Ellen White has doctrinal authority. But the pen of inspiration says something different. She's inspired, and her inspiration points us to one source for our foundation. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is indispensable for the elimination of the spirit of prejudice. Now, this is important. When we come to the study of God's word with the spirit of prejudice, there's another word for it, it's called pride of opinion. I know best. Well, I'm the genius around here, and you're going to listen to me. That's what that means. Prejudice. When the Spirit of God rests upon you, there will be no feeling of envy or jealousy in examining another's position. There will be no spirit of accusation, no spirit of criticism, such as Satan inspired in the hearts of the Jewish leaders against Christ. Then it says, test the new life. The following tests are recommended by Ellen G. White. Is it Christ-centered? Number one. Number two, to belong to the testimony. And number three, does it produce fruits of righteousness? That was similar to sin, righteousness, and judgment. Isn't that similar? Pretty, pretty similar. Now, White recommended a simple test to determine new life. Does this light and knowledge that I have found and which places me at variance with my brethren draw me more closely to Christ? 
does it make my Savior more precious to me and make my character more closely resemble his? That's a quote from Elmore about the law and the testimony. God has given direction by which we may test every doctrine. We may test every doctrine. For the law and the testimony, they speak not according to this word, as there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 20. <coughs> if the light presented meets this test, we are not to refuse to accept it because it does not agree with our idea. Number three, does it produce fruits of righteousness? The most convincing testimony that we can bear to others that we have the truth is the spirit which attends the advocacy of that truth. If it sanctifies the heart of the deceiver, if it makes him gentle, kind, forbearing, true and Christ-like, then he will give some evidence of the fact that he has the genuine truth. But if he acts as did the Jews when their opinions and ideas were crossed, then we certainly cannot receive such testimony, for it does not produce the truth of Christ. So this is a little introduction into Advent history. It's crucial that we understand that it was brought into this world by the hand of God himself through his word. Miller opened up the Bible and began to study for himself the word of God. And in that word, Miller's testimony is he found the Savior that he could throw, his, throw himself into the arms of. He found one he thought he could never experience. He said he thought he could never find such a being as Christ. <coughs> and if we understand our Advent history as we should, we will find just that person. Amen. You'll find him. And in the message, Behold, the bridegroom comes, go ye out to meet him, is an invitation to receive Christ and all his righteousness. <coughs> There are some things that people don't understand about the 1888 movement that I'm, I'm beginning to get an inkling of. There are some, for many years now, have been teaching that we need to force the General Conference to make a uh, perfect confession. Well, I think that is more. That message was to bring righteousness personally to the men who needed it in 1888. <coughs> Personal message from heaven. And yes, the men at the General Conference need the righteousness of Christ personally. But when we study it to see what's wrong with others, we don't receive it ourselves. We don't receive it ourselves. The message of 1888 is that we receive the foundation of all its glory, and all its power, and all its might. We sorely miss the boat. The boat is about the dog. You know, the dream in the right time period <coughs> it was recorded about okay. the boat coming to God. It is important that we understand that Jesus is about the dog. And we need to come to grips with our own uh, experience in that. It needs to become personal. It needs need to become so personal that in their day, when this message was given, and they were convinced that Jesus was coming. The glorious, their glorious hope was that Jesus was about to come. They forsook everything in this world. And it wasn't done through fanaticism. It wasn't done through excitement. But it was based on the foundation of God's word. So I hope that this gives you a little introduction into, into Advent history. And by God's grace, we'll try to explore a little more this week. But we need desperately uh, some of the books I've been reading are hard to come by. Some of you don't live in areas where you can get a hold of these books. But I'm going to leave you my name and address this week. And by God's grace, if I can get these books for you and get them to you, we are going to try to get you some of this stuff so you can have it for your library. There are books that are available out there that you use bookstores. Now, I've come to learn something else. There are men in our past that have denied the message. One of them, well, I shouldn't say they denied the message. I'm not God. I'm not the judge. But they stepped off the platform in certain directions. Let me put it that way that I can see. But yet their books are valuable to us as a people because they have primary source information that we need. So don't discard them on the words of others who say, oh, this guy might be a Jesuit, or this guy might be a 
this, so this guy might be that. But the books that we have, one of them that's very important that you get is Leroy Edmund Froome. Froome's book has primary source footnotes that you can't find anywhere else. That's what, what he's good for. So when, there are other people who won't even read the book because they've been told that he, they think he's a Jesuit. That's nonsense. If he was, who cares? Primary source information is what we're after. All right? So this week, I might be making references to some books that none of you might never have seen or don't know where to go get them. And uh, one of the things I've learned is this, that in the spirit of prophecy, testimonies, volume one, spiritual gifts, all three, four volumes, they now originally were four volumes, but they're now in two little volumes, they're actually four. Those have very good uh, first-hand accounts of Advent history by Alan White. One of the other things I've learned is that when you read the Great Controversy and the Spiritual Gifts and write one of the testimonies and other places where she account, reaccounts this history for us, one of the things you need to recognize is that Ellen White is writing to you subjectively, not objectively. If it's objectively, it's outside. It's not from inside. So when Ellen White writes the great controversy about the histories of the Millerite movement, don't let this escape you. She's writing to you from her experience in the movement. So it's subjective. I might be a little hard to grasp, but it's very important that you understand. She's writing to you what she went through. And then it gets more interesting and also it allows you to see something about the movement that otherwise you will never see. So I hope this has been of some help and uh, we want to uh, finish the work so that you know we can go home. There is a need for people who have family members here that are not uh, in the church and uh, there are some of us who are old time Adventists. My family are not. There are some here that have, have family members that were raised in this church who are outside of it. And the relevancy of our understanding of our history will help us to bring them back. And time is short. And I've learned something here about this, is that the more we put this off, the more time we need. And if we want to be able to articulate this to our friends and to our loved ones, so that, is, so that it is a glorious manifestation of the power of God in the world, we have to know these things. So my <coughs> prayer is this morning that we, I have pricked your interest that you will begin to look at that in history differently. Because what we're going to try to cover this week is some aspects of how this came into history. The who's, the why's, and the where. And I hope it will be more relevant. So let's have prayer and go have breakfast. <laughs> Loving Father in heaven, you are the one that tells the end from the beginning. You are the Alpha and the Omega. But in all this glorious manifestation, you're, you're the friend of sinners. Paul says, you humbled yourself even to the death of the cross. And it was for us that you did these things, and you revealed these things to us in the world. Please help us, dear Lord, to love you in return for all your goodness and mercy to us. And Lord, we, we need to have a deep spiritual understanding of what it means to be forgiven. To understand how much you do really love us. That if we will understand these things and uh, love you in return, that we will love your appearing and that we will get this message with all of our hearts. Please uh, help our unbelief and uh, uh, help us as we continue these studies this week. We pray in Jesus' name.